Good afternoon and welcome. I am Ruth Katz, Executive Director of the Health Medicine and Society Program at the Aspen Institute. Thank you all for zooming in for this extraordinary session of Public Health Grand Rounds at the Aspen Institute. We're very excited about today's program and most grateful to our outstanding speakers and moderator, and of course, all of you for taking time from your busy schedules to be with us. Before I introduce our speakers, let me take a moment to tell you a little bit about this event. Many of you know that Grand Rounds is the time-honored feature of medicine designed to keep clinicians up to date about scientific and medical advances and to promote excellence in research and practice. This ongoing program, now in its sixth year, borrows from that tradition to advance knowledge about the cutting edge public health issues of the day. I would note actually with much despair and, and amazement that our last grand round session was held a year ago last week in person when we brought to the Aspen stage, Tony Fauci, Ron Klain, and Nancy Messonnier, names now well known to all of us to discuss what was then a relatively little known and little understood bug, the new coronavirus. Just hours before that meeting, the word COVID entered our lexicon as the name for the disease caused by the new coronavirus. Who knew then where our country would be one year later? As for this program, one year later, Public Health Grand Rounds at the Aspen Institute returns to focus on myriad issues that have emerged, one of the myriad issues that have emerged within the context of the COVID pandemic, suicide and suicide prevention. I think we would all agree that none is more critical than this. There's much to get to, and I don't wanna take up much more time now, but just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. We are videotaping today's program and it will be up on our website within 24 hours or so. Our panel discussion will run about 30 minutes after which speakers will take your questions and comments. Please feel free to submit your questions throughout the panel discussion using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We wanna get those lined up so we can take as many as possible. And now, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Dr. Deb Howry is Director of the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, which includes work related to suicide and suicide prevention. In her role there, Deb leads innovative research and science-based programs to prevent injuries and violence and to reduce their consequences. Dr. Christine Moutier is Chief Medical Officer at the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, a voluntary organization that gives those affected by suicide a nationwide community, empowered by research, education, and advocacy to take action against this leading cause of death. Christine has appeared in numerous print, radio, and television outlets, and recently authored the major article, Suicide Prevention in the COVID-19 Era. Finally, today's moderator is Rebecca Ruiz, a senior features writer at Mashable, a leading source for news, information, and resources for the connected generation. She frequently reports on mental health, science, parenting, and politics for Mashable's social good coverage. Prior to joining Mashable, Rebecca was a staff writer, reporter, and editor at NBC News Digital, special reports project director at the American Prospect and staff writer at Forbes. Welcome to all of you. And thank you for being here for this very important conversation. It's really terrific to have you. And of course, our thanks again to all of you in the audience for joining us. We look forward to seeing you for our next Public Health Grand Round session. Until then, please be well and stay safe. Rebecca, it's all yours. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks so much. Ruth. Um, I'm honored to be here today to moderate this conversation between two uh, terrific suicide prevention experts. And my goal is to help those of you watching um, and provide you with resources and strategies and information, and most of all, hope when it comes to preventing suicide in the pandemic and beyond. And I first want to take a few steps back 
and provide some context um, about where we are and where we've come from uh, in suicide prevention. So for two decades, suicide prevention had, I mean, suicide rates had been increasing until 2019 when they began to decline. Unfortunately, that was followed by the pandemic, which raised questions about whether or not we'd see an increase in suicide. So I wanna start by asking uh, both uh, Deb and Christine about where we've come from and do we know why suicide rates began to decline prior to the pandemic and is there any evidence that uh, we should expect them to increase? So I, I can jump in um, and, and start and Christine can uh, add to it. What I would say is, you know, for, as you mentioned, you know, for about two decades, you know, 1999 to um, 2019, suicide rates increased 33%. So really a, a, a significant increase, you know, over this time. Yes, they, they have decreased now in 2019 um, by about 2%. But what I would say is a single year does not mean a trend. Um, you know, it can go up or down. Um, we certainly would love to see this continue, but it's too soon to say that. Um, and I think we need to look at this with caution because uh, we are seeing rates of emotional distress go up. Um, suicide visits to emergency departments um, have gone up, but we're not seeing an increase in suicide deaths, which is good. Um, you know, for the first six months of uh, 2020, there has not been an increase in suicide deaths. Um, you know, when, when you weigh all that's going on though with the pandemic though, there are some things that um, worry us and worry researchers and practitioners in the field that things like social isolation, um, job stress, increased use of substances that we've seen you know, in many of our surveys, all that could lead to an increase in suicide deaths. Um, so I'll stop there and see what Christine wants to add. Sure, that's, that's really helpful, Deb. And I would just add, um, backing up again, that we know from the science that suicide is complex for an individual's risk and certainly for a population's risk. But at the end of the day, suicide is a complex health related outcome. And from that standpoint, you know, the way I look at the rise in rates over the last couple of decades is that there are numerous factors at play that are sort of secular um, happenings in our environment, some things that are not well under our control, um, economic trends and aspects of large scale culture, attitudes towards mental health. But there are many things that pertain to suicide risk and prevention that we do have quite a bit of control over. Um, and, and those relate to our, our own mental health, well-being, accessing health care, taking stigma out of these discussions in our home, in our neighborhoods, in our workplace. Um, so we, we are very encouraged by that, that um, small, not trend, but the 2019 data point. We are also encouraged by this initial uh, period that we do have data for the US national data for the first six months of 2020. We have state uh, level data for nine or 10 states now that looks equally reassuring overall. And some of those actually encompass the full year of 2020. We also have international data that is also reassuring for the most part where suicide rates during the pandemic did not rise and in some instances were actually lower than pre-pandemic rates. Um, you know, during periods of natural disasters and pandemics of the past, we have seen suicide rates go down for periods of time. Sometimes they, they rise again, and that's what we need to be very, um, really actually very vigilant about. Like I would not be complacent at all looking at this data because here we are now in 2021 and we have reasons to be concerned about mental health deterioration, the economy, employment, many things that do press on suicide risk, and but there are many pathways forward, which I know we're going to get into um, in our discussion. Yeah, and I think it's important to, and you both of you have touched on this, the myths and misperceptions around suicide. Um, why does it happen? And a lot of it in the media sometimes, and in our own personal get conversations, gets boiled down to a single event, a single reason. And of course, we know it's much more complex than that. So I'd love for both of you to just touch on some of the myths and misperceptions that can mislead us when it comes to understanding suicide risk. I, th I think for me, one of the things that um, I really want to say is the pandemic is not causing suicide. You know, people will say the pandemic is why we're seeing, you know, suicide deaths. 
there's as Christine you know so articulately said there's not a single thing that leads to a suicide death it's it's many things and so with the pandemic you might have you know job stressors um, isolation um, social disruption you might not be able to access your regular medical care um, you know if you have substance use problems those might be increasing or you might have new substance uses so it's not quote the pandemic because then we would hope that like a year from now you know when we aren't experiencing the pandemic that suicide deaths would significantly decrease, you know, and we know it's all these other contributing factors. And I, I think the other thing I, I would say is that people worry about if you talk about suicide or you talk with somebody about suicide, that might make them more likely um, to attempt suicide. And we know that talking to somebody about suicide, if you're worried about them, is the right thing to do and is actually really protective. And so that's a common misperception that I always like to address. I think another one that, you know, for, for healthcare professionals or for even parents, we, we sometimes mix up um, people who are expressing their distress in a way that, um, you know, for whatever reason might be questioned as, you know, the word manipulative might come up. And, you know, the truth is that many, many people experience suicidal thoughts and, and actually don't talk about them because it's so highly stigmatized and they're not sure who is safe to talk to. And so when somebody does start indicating their true level of distress going on on the inside, it is always to be taken seriously. A, a cry for help simply means there is a need that needs to be met and, and an issue that needs to be addressed or evaluated. Um, and, and certainly a mental health professional or a primary care provider can be can be an important part of, of that moment. But you know, I've, I've heard some very strange assumptions out there about people who talk about it aren't the ones to be worried about and things that are just simply not true. It, if somebody talks about it, I would actually thank them for taking the risk to share something so personal and private and, and support them and tell them that you know there's there's no challenge that's too great that, that together we can't get through or that there's help available for. And I think adding to that too, I think it's a positive thing when we hear that there's been you know, increase um, seeking care in an emergency department or increase outreach to um, crisis hotlines because that means people are reaching out and getting the care needed and we know that can be protected and prevent the suicide death. Yeah, that just, you just reminded me, Deb, because I think there's been a lot of confusion about the increases in distress, depression, anxiety, isolation, substance use, suicidal thoughts, and, and an automatic assumption that that means that suicide rates are rising. And, and just like Deb, you just said that when people are actually expressing those experience of distress, you know, distress like physical pain is a warning sign. It's telling your, your brain, your system, that something needs to be looked into and addressed potentially. Um, and so it, 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 in fact, in other periods of time, when rates of distress were higher, and when connecting to help, whether it's a crisis line, your primary care doctor, a therapist, or even some peer-to-peer -peer, um, supportive interactions take place, that that mitigates against those um, levels of distress and suicide risk. So I, I, you know, never underestimate the potential for suicide prevention efforts to be effective, um, and that doesn't mean that in every instance, so for example, if you've lost a loved one to suicide, or if you're a clinician and you've lost a patient to suicide, it's never to say that that one instance um, was an issue of fault or um, it, it's about moving forward and how as a society, we can do so much better from a public health perspective and to scale the treatments and the interventions um, that can make a difference. And, and I know we're going to talk more about it, but that can start in childhood all the way through. We can have, we can see upstream as well as acute moments of distress where intervention can save a life. Thank you for that. And we will get to in a little bit, some of the strategies that we can use both for ourselves if we're struggling and for the people that we love or the people that we work with or serve. Um, I wanna talk about how a little bit about how data can actually dispel some of the myths and misperceptions that we've been talking about. So we have data to, to, to give us more information about what rates really look like. Um, I wanna know, um, 
what's the timeline, right? When will we kind of have a better understanding more than we have now around what the suicide rate was like in 2020? Um, and also some of the numbers that we were talking about earlier, does that include um, all ages, minors included? So the, the numbers we have now through July does include um, all ages, but because it's not the final data yet, it's not broken out by age group. Usually there's about a six month delay to have all of the data. Um, so you know, I would expect about six months from now, maybe four months from now, we'll have all of the 2020 data, but that's for the national picture. And as Christine was saying, there's some states that have already been able to report their full 2020 data. Um, and some have looked at it by different demographics. And you know, what I would flag is um, it's not um, necessarily always age groups. It could be some racial and ethnic differences that we're seeing. And uh, I think that really aligns with what we're seeing with some of the surveys we've done at CDC around um, mental health, you know, suicidal ideation to where um, Hispanics and Blacks were reporting higher rates of suicidal ideation, but also um, non-paid caregivers and essential workers. And, and so as we're looking at suicide trends, I think it's really important to look at the populations within them and not just the overall number, but where are the changes happening, both positive to where we can learn from that and say, you know, what interventions are working, but also where are we, you know, where are we having these increase in deaths and where do we need to focus and, and why? So yeah. let's talk about that, right? Because the, the populations that are at greater risk um, deserve yeah. our attention um, and some focus on, on solutions as well. Um, so let's dig a little bit deeper. And where are we seeing, uh, as you said, Deb, um, we have some uh, breakdown along uh, race and ethnicity um, and you know uh, essential worker status, healthcare worker status, perhaps. So let's talk about some of those risk factors they may be experiencing. You want to go first, Tim? <laughs> you go. <laughs> sure. Okay. So, um, we're what we're probably both thinking of is the data out of Maryland and Connecticut, which overall, again, showed that their overall state population rate of suicide went down um, during the period of, in their case, it was the first several months of the pandemic. However, when they broke it out by race ethnicity, it did show that non-white populations in Maryland, and, and I think they actually um, called it black uh, populations in Connecticut, had increases in, in their rates. And so um, it's, it's a time when you know, we do need to be thinking about the way that um, not just the pandemic, but certainly the pandemic, as well as other aspects of accessing care, um, barriers to um, addressing one's own mental health needs and suicide risk, economic barriers, educational health disparities. And of course, a lot of this was pre-existing before the pandemic for decades and decades. And now those disparities are being accentuated all the more. Um, and, you know, so it, it's, it's, it's very complicated. And like Deb said, the pandemic and the, and the ensuing um, ramifications on people can be, can be extreme and severe um, and tap right into their sort of suicide risk or vulnerability. Or it may be that, that um, suicides that occurred during the pandemic could actually have been driven more primarily by mental health conditions that pre-existed before the pandemic, for example. Um, and there are other populations that we also have our eye on that we are very concerned about, essential workers, frontline health workers, youth, um, mainly because their experience um, and sort of their brain development is, is at a place where this disruption, especially to social development, um, and learning and sense of identity and all those things that are really critically important just developmentally are being disrupted in some unique ways. Um, however, again, we, we don't presume what that will translate to in terms of suicide risks. In fact, pre-pandemic times, young people will have always had higher rates of suicidal ideation than middle-aged and older adults, but lower rates generally of suicide, um, except for certain populations like, like Native American, uh, American Indian, uh, Alaska Native, their suicide rates do, unfortunately, um, they are sh shifted earlier in the life cycle. And I think what I would add is, you know, this is where we are hearing about trends, you know, based on some states and just some 
on some surveys, but I think also thinking about other populations like pre-pandemic, you know, you know, older adults, you know, rural populations, um, veterans, you know, can be at increased risk of suicide death. And when I think about older adults or rural populations right now and the issues around um, you know, physical distancing and some of the isolation and economic disruption. Um, these populations are, you know, definitely impacted by that. And so I think looking at ways we can strengthen, you know, support through social connectedness, um, just so much that we can do to prevent these suicide deaths. I think that's what Christine and I really want to message is, you know, we're, we're delighted that there's a decrease in suicide deaths, but we're concerned that with a lot of the factors from the pandemic and even pre-pandemic, that we need to focus on preventing suicide deaths now um, because we don't wanna see that number go back up. So I wanna talk about two risk factors. One of them is the isolation that's already been brought up, right? And so many of us have felt that isolation, right? And it's all affected us differently depending on our support networks, our resources available to us, um, but that's a key thing. Um, and also firearm purchases, which I know have skyrocketed during the pandemic and are related to uh, uh, suicide rates. And so let's talk a little bit about those two risk factors and what we might do to mediate um, their effect on people. Yeah, those are both known risk factors for suicide pre-pandemic. So when you look at, for example, the way that suicide rates trends are geographically in the United States, you'll see that the highest rates are in the sort of Rocky Mountain Western Belt uh, region where um, firearm ownership is higher, access to health care and particularly mental health care is lower, where there's a culture that sort of overemphasizes stoicism and self-sufficiency. Um, and, you know, so those factors, as you say now during the pandemic are now potentially um, becoming even more widespread with that increase in, in firearms purchase and the almost ubiquitous experience of kind of like, how do we overcome the, this physical distancing um, experience that we're in? Um, you know, I would just say that, again, it's, it's always on a, on a bed of other risk factors that are there. And so if somebody is in their well state of, of mental health, they can overcome an experience of, of physical isolation simply by being proactive and reaching out and staying socially connected, whether it's work, neighborhood, family, Zoom, game nights. I mean, you, you've seen, we've seen it all. Um, but for people who have pre-existing vulnerabilities, let's say, um, a depressive illness, a, a history of addiction, um, a previous suicide attempt or family history of, of suicide, um, then, then that, that experience may be sometimes compounded also with those other factors we've talked about, the disproportionate impact. So economically, um, if you were already a marginalized um, in a marginalized population, not having a robust support network around you then of course it's all the more difficult to connect with that and establish those connections. It's one of the reasons we actually worry about older adults whose sense of connectivity relies on social services, some of which became disrupted um, during the pandemic. So those are some of the ways that I think about it. And, and um, I would maybe after Deb, I'd like to hear your thoughts and maybe we can come back to some of the solutions around um, firearm suicide prevention is one specific uh, topic. And as you were talking, that's where I kept thinking is, you know, right now with fi increase of firearm purchases, um, and we're also seeing drug overdoses go up. And so to me, that talks about storing any dangerous item in the household safely. And so firearms and medications, when you've got kids at home or somebody who might be having suicidal ideation, we know that um, some people who die by suicide decide within five to 10 minutes to do that. And so if that firearm of those medications are stored safely, that can prevent the suicide death. And I think going to the social isolation, um, my daughter does playdates all the time via FaceTime now. And I kept thinking, you know, doesn't she miss, you know, seeing her friends more? And um, every kid is different, you know, but she for her, that's the virtual connection that she needs. So I think looking for ways to do that. We've seen a lot of communities really rise to the occasion, like Colorado has communities that care and is looking for sources of strength and like engaging youth in different social media and connecting them to caring adults virtually. 
you know, and so I think there's ways to do that across the community to engage people. Um, and that's protective. And I think um, thinking about protective factors is so important because we, we want to have um, suicide deaths prevented and look for ways that we can really have that long lasting impact really on the community as well as the individual. There was a study that was just out yesterday, in fact, that found older adults who were receiving uh, meals through Meals on Wheels and connected them, there were several hundred of them, connected them to young trained volunteers, 17 to 23 years old, and they offered them a phone call per day. And at the end of the week, they let them opt in for between two or up to five phone calls per week. And most people opted for five. Um, and there was a control group and the people, uh, the older adults who were in the phone call group showed decreases in depression scores, anxiety scores, loneliness scores. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a um, sort of community response to, that, that could be organized and actually be more systematic to actually target those who are in a more vulnerable place. So we've touched on, um, on, uh of course, protective factors. Um, I, Deb, I think the CDC has a list of protective factors and I would love if actually you could just rattle those off at once um, so that people could hear them, you know, uh, one against the, the next and, and get a sense of what they can be looking for in order to increase their own resilience and, and also help others um, just to be a supportive presence in people's lives, even if it's as simple as that. So, you know, we have several strategies that we think are, are, are really protective and can apply to individuals and communities. And, you know, one is just things like strengthening economic supports. And I think we're seeing that right now as people have, you know, job losses or economic concerns. And the one CDC survey that talked about emotional distress, it was people worried about getting food for their family. So making sure that you do have um, that is really important. Um, and Christine talked a little bit about this too, but making sure you've got access, you know, to care as needed, that's protective. Whether it's um, a counselor, medical care, uh, mental health care, um, ways to promote connectedness, I think is one of the community level ways to really have those protective factors. Um, and South Carolina has done a great job with strengthening families to where they've got kids and their parents virtually engaging in conflict resolution and um, promoting positive relationships. And again, that's long lasting and, and has that protective factor. Um, and then I think positive media messaging, <laughs> which I'm delighted you're our moderator, because we, we, we know that, that you know, if you are talking about suicide um, in a way that glamorizes it or misstates things, um, that's not beneficial. If we can talk about it um, on how to seek care, what to look for, that is helpful because then we're connecting people to resources that are needed. Um, and then I think really identifying and, and supporting people who are at risk, things like gatekeeper programs or some of the QPR programs to where you're helping identify and connect. I'd say all those things really around connectedness, support um, are really important. Yeah, and I'll just add that there are policy implications and opportunities right now um, being introduced or, or really already passed in the House and that will come before the Senate shortly. And um, all of us can play a role in advocacy, um, truly. There are literally dozens of, of legislative um, pieces right now ready for um, you know, going before our, our policymakers. And, and they include things around lethal means, extreme risk protective orders. They include things that will make sure that telehealth services remain strongly intact. They provide more funding for mental health and addiction services, extremely important, again, to also to be made available through telehealth. Um, there, is, there are two pieces I'll specifically mention. There is one called Pursuing Equity in Mental Health Act that looks to give communities of color um, the same level of access to culturally competent mental health care. It's extremely important. Another one, the Dr. Lorna Breen Healthcare Provider Protection Act looks to fund and evaluate the interventions for us as healthcare professionals that have our community at risk during COVID. That is a, that is a totally new um, type of piece of legislation that um, you know, I think if anything during COVID, it's interesting. These, these issues of mental health stigma and suicide risk, have we've been living with them for, for decades. 
I think now we're becoming a little bit more sophisticated as a society, in part because of COVID. Like it raised the 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 issue of mental health needs so that we can understand that that another aspect of the pandemic is actually the mental health experience of it rather than just only focusing on the the physical uh, viral impact. And I think just the one thing I would add to is looking long term at prevention and thinking about adverse childhood experiences, you know, and how ways we can really build up and strengthen our children around resilience. Um, Ohio has been doing some great work with some virtual trainings around suicide identification prevention, as well as ACEs training, you know, for teachers and educational staff. And I think the more that we can really look at how do we provide those safe, stable, nurturing relationships for kids? How do we do things like, um, I know Christine's um, foundation has done great work with the good behavior game, you know, with implementing that. I think when you can look at ways to have these programs in place and improve funding and reach of a lot of the social emotional learning, that provides that long-term support for protective factors and policies. Yeah, thank you for that thorough discussion of the importance of policy because I think for so long we've we've talked about suicide as an individual problem. And it really is um, a structural issue that we need to address from multiple angles and a public health approach. Um, it can't be just someone's um, uh, individual battle. Um, so I think that's just so crucial um, that we talk about that. Um, we have a few minutes left before our Q&A session, and I want to make sure that we um, get to some practical advice for two scenarios. So one is um, you have someone who is struggling, right? Maybe they're not getting food on the table. They don't know, they're not, they don't know if the stimulus is going to come through, if they're going to get extra money to pay rent. You know, the list goes on. Maybe they had a pre-existing mental health condition. Um, all the factors we talked about that can play a role and they're starting to have suicidal thoughts. Um, what can they do? Well, there are crisis resources available 24 seven that um, we're actually gonna leave you with at the end of this session on a slide. Um, and and it, it is a time when people are accessing those services more than ever before. And that that is actually a very positive thing. Um, if, if you are, it kind of depends on your relationship to this, this person, but if you are in their life as a family member, a friend, an acquaintance, a healthcare professional, it's really a time to check in on them and invite them into an open conversation where you actually practice more listening than talking. And, and the, the words that, that I would say would be things like, there is simply no shame or stigma in experiencing distress right now. It's sort of in a way ubiquitous. Um, many people are suffering and but there is a way through, there's help available, and I will be here for you to help you find that help. Um, so that that's, you know, it's not to take the burden on yourself um, if you're not a, a healthcare professional, but it is to say that we would do the same if somebody were going through cancer or, you know, had some other type of need in their life, we would be there for them. And we can just get rid of stigma and approach it in the exact same manner as you would in your normal caring um, relationship to, to an individual like that. And, and there's a, um, it'll be on our slide, I believe, the be the one to.org. And there's some great um, tools, I, I'd say, really along what Christine said to where, you know, ask, you know, how they're feeling, ask if, you know, they're thinking about hurting themselves. Then you want to keep them safe is the next step to, you know, assess, you know, how, how real are these thoughts, you know, and is there a weapon in the home or are there medications? You know, what can you do to help with that? Um, really be there for them, you know, help with that connectedness, whether now it's FaceTime, you know, or maybe sitting, um, you know, several feet apart outside with masks on and, and connecting, um, helping them connect to those resources like the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Um, and then I love that Meals on Wheels example, because I think it's not just doing it once, but having that ongoing. And so it's really about the follow-up to that ongoing connectedness to check in on someone or all things that you can do. I, I would just encourage everyone who's participating um, that even if you haven't had these kinds of conversations before, you can, and, and you don't need to assume that the person will feel offended. In fact, if you approach them in a caring way um, and just want to hear what it is that they're experiencing, that's, that's it. And who doesn't want to, you know, sort of experience that, um, that feeling of being cared for? 
Um, so it does not have to be paternalistic. People are much more willing to go um, and cooperate with you in an effort to make their environment safe, just like Deb was saying. So I would just really encourage you, take the risk, don't shy away from these kinds of conversations. And there are, there are guides um, to, to start the conversation or to know kind of the words to say. Um, on our website, AFSP.org, there's a campaign called hashtag real convo where we actually have tips and kind of resources about how to approach someone you're worried about. And it sees the awkward is another good uh, PSA campaign um, targeted for younger people who may feel really awkward um, about asking a friend about the distress they may be experiencing um, and also relevant for people who work with younger people. Yeah, thanks for bringing um, us. I wanna, yeah, uh, I want to um, sort of call from the, the questions that have come in. And uh, so you, I may answer some of them propose some of them specifically, I may try to, uh, you know, get them a little bit broader and, and address some of the heart of the question. I want to start with um, for suicide loss survivors. Um, this is a very difficult time. Um, and they may have family members who are experiencing their own feelings around uh, the, the suicide loss they've uh, had in the past or being affected by the pandemic and, and all the factors we've discussed, you know, grappling with their own feelings of suicide. So how can we think about this time period for loss survivors? Yeah, I mean, suicide loss um, and bereavement it, it tends to be already different um, in that sometimes friends and community members don't know how to support the, the individual who's, who's gone through the loss as well. Um, and, and now with the pandemic, it may be even harder to sort of feel that sense of support and feel connected. But I would just say that know that you are not alone in your grief, um, even if it, it manifests itself differently than it is, you know, your spouse or others in your family, everyone is going through their own grief journey, but you can be in it together. And among suicide loss survivors, there is a very strong network of community and support. And I would just encourage you to tap into those resources. There are support groups happening virtually. We have a listing of over 500 suicide loss support groups on our website, AFSP.org. Um, and, and many, many, many more. I think the key is to just allow yourself to feel, be authentic with that, and to find ways to safely process that, whether um, it doesn't even have to be with a therapist, although if that's something that you would lean on for grief in general, then absolutely. But it's not that grief is pathological at all. Um, it's that, that by processing and connecting and really talking it through, or again, whatever that way of processing is for you, um, that's an important part of sort of the healing process. We also had a question about um, the uh, suicide increase in Japan. And the reason I mentioned this is because um, it read headlines in the last week in the New York Times. And it also um, sort of brings to the fore, how do we kind of read about, uh, you know, whether it's based on anecdote or population level data from other countries about suicide risk, increased suicide in like, for example, high school communities, um, you know, what can we make of some of the data that might come out from other countries um, or might come out in our own communities, um, keeping in mind sort of the cautious approach that you mentioned at the outset? Well, the, Japan is actually one of the, really the only country of the 24 countries that we have data from um, that has shown actually a clear cut rise in suicide rates starting in July. So it is an outlier in that regard so far. Remember the pandemic is not the only thing happening in our worlds. And so in Japan, there were a number of other things happening including a series of celebrity suicide deaths that were widely publicized that, that could have actually impacted. Contagion is, um, is real when, when media um, is, is overly sensationalistic or graphic about those suicides. Um, but but yes, when you when you read in, in a media report that there is a rise in the cluster and be just have a, a feeling of caution around that because sometimes the media is very quick to jump to conclusions that that simply are not evident um, at all and in fact the data may uh, point to the opposite and and the the biggest thing is I I would not let it give you a sense of futility 
like with all of this going on, hope here it is. Like I think everyone was almost expecting there to be that. Um, and it's it's there's not this sort of one cause and effect phenomenon according to the science of suicide risk. So know that there are things that we can always be doing in our own lives for our loved ones. If you're a teacher with your students, if you're a health professional with your patients, that can absolutely reduce suicide risk for those around you. And I think like with the media, um, they're, they're quick, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't generalize like this, but you'll see like a story to where it might be about increases since the past year. But if you actually look at some of these um, groups that they're reporting on, if you look at the trends over many, many years, um, these aren't necessarily surges. And so I think that's where accurate reporting, using the data is really important and reporting it in um, an appropriate way, again, to where it's not sensationalizing it. Like Christine said, it's about what to look for and people you're worried about, how to connect because we don't want the story to be around like the sensational title. We want it to be about how we can prevent suicide, how can we connect people that need it. Um, and Facebook has done a really nice job recently. They, they've changed their policies to demote articles that don't follow those good reporting standards and to promote those that talk about health seeking. So let's also, um, in terms of helping people and, and noticing those um, symptoms or, or risk factors, how do we do that virtually? Um, and I know this question came up for someone who is a teacher and trying to figure out how do I look for those signs and symptoms um, on Zoom when I, the only time I might be seeing my, my student um, and, um, and maybe they're not even on camera, right? So let's help people figure this might sound strange, but I really believe this, that, that for many of us as human beings, our sort of gut instinct, our radar goes off when somebody's usual behavior patterns shift into a different zone. And we've kind of, in a way, talked ourselves out of paying attention to that for years and years for many different reasons. But, you know, so as a teacher, I think you're, you are poised actually um, believe it or not, more so than most other people in these children's lives, to be noticing those even subtle changes uh, and variations in, in behavior. And if you do, I think a caring inquiry, either with the student, him or herself, with the parent, um, you know, to be, we, we look at suicide prevention as sort of a safety net. It requires, ideally, a team approach so that no one person and only their observations are, are the only thing. So like if you're a parent and you become concerned, you can engage the other adults in your, um, in your child's life to ask them what they're seeing, to ask them to check in on your child. The presence of a caring adult outside the family is incredibly protective for a child as well. And I think with the virtual environment, you can actually have a, a sense for like what kind of environment the child or your coworker is in too, and, and look for any sort of um, environmental um, changes too that might be concerning. A couple of questions have come up around um, a shortage of healthcare providers. Um, and that is not everyone wants to see a, a healthcare provider when they are feeling, experiencing suicidal thoughts or behavior. Not everyone wants to start a relationship with a clinician. Um, however, for those who do or are seeking that, um, how, and for those who are healthcare providers or clinicians and need, trying to get people help, um, but there just frankly aren't enough providers um, out there. How can we navigate that uh, structural issue? Yeah, I, you know, it, there's so many layers to this. Um, and it, and even when you have great insurance it, and great resources, it can still be difficult. Um, so I think, you know, the key is, is really setting an intention to find the right resource for you. That could be a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a, a counselor, a social worker, a primary care physician or nurse practitioner. It could be a counselor in the school um, as well. Um, there, there are also peer-to-peer -peer programs now that are looking very encouraging because you're right, we will we do not have enough mental health professionals and won't for some time. So, um, I mean, training and equipping primary care to be ready to address, identify and handle compassionately, confidently, competently, that, that is a, a major effort that we're involved with at AFSP as part of our project 2025 is to sort of elevate the, the, the um, ability and 
competence among primary care providers, but again, also among other caring individuals, peer support, parents, teachers, uh, first responders. Um, in terms of the, um, the ways in which uh, we can support marginalized communities, um, that question has come up, especially where there may be language barriers or different types of stigma around uh, help seeking. Um, what are your thoughts on culturally competent and uh, uh, approaches to uh, providing those resources or um, accessing them? We need much more and we need to grow the pipeline and there needs to be funding to do this so that there is culturally competent and appropriate care available for all um, underrepresented minority groups and marginalized groups. So we're talking about communities of color. Um, we're talking about even um, Asian American communities. We're talking about LGBTQ communities, all of that um, does require some additional training in terms of cultural competency. And um, there, there's there been far too little attention paid to this. And I, I think now is the moment because of everything that we've been talking about, as well as the, the racial social justice movement that's going on, that I think we will see great efforts and strides, but we, we have to um, really keep paying attention to that. And CDC has a campaign um, that came out recently called, um, you know, the How Right Now. And it does have, um, it is translated in Spanish as well. And it's really targeted for um, those that are really being adversely affected by COVID right now to help with stress, grief and, and loss. And some of the target populations include, you know, older adults and their caregivers, um, people with pre-existing physical mental health conditions, people experiencing violence, you know, cause we know that certainly violence in the home is a stressor right now and can um, cause increased um, suicidality and then people experiencing economic distress. And so it's got tools and appropriate messaging to help really engage people and provide supports for that. Thank you for that, such important work. Um, I, I see we're nearing the end of our time here and I wanted to actually just give both of you an opportunity to, to share some parting thoughts. And we've talked about a lot. Um, there are a lot of important questions uh, questions that unfortunately we just don't have time to get to. Um, there is a question about whether or not we can get a list of the legislation that Christine was mentioning earlier. And we'll see about what can kind of create that roundup and, and share it uh, following the, the, the uh, webinar. Um, but beyond that, um, I, I just would like to invite both of you to share your, your parting thoughts and, and what hope you have uh, moving forward. I can go first. I mean, this conversation alone is, is very encouraging. There are many pathways forward at the policy level, um, at the community level, which we, we didn't talk at quite as much about, um, but those programs and ways to engage are there as well. And then at the individual and family level. And um, this is not a simple um, issue. And so it will not be a one solution or one moment kind of uh, solution or problem solving process. This will be one of many, many ongoing uh, conversations and actions that we can take. And I, I really appreciate the Aspen Institute's um, you know, interest in, in making suicide prevention a priority and a topic during the pandemic and um, the work that, that we um, are privileged to do with the CDC at the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention ongoing will be incredibly important in this effort. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. And I think to, to the listeners, just know that you have a role to play and you're also not alone if you're suffering. I should just say ditto. Um, <laughs> that's really hard to, uh, to uh, I mean, that was so articulate. I, I think what I would just end with is that um, this conversation is really helpful. I think all the attention we've had around the pandemic and speaking more about suicide is so important because it helps dispel myths. It helps really reduce stigma around help seeking and talking about suicide. And my hope is that with all the disparities and all the issues that have been really addressed and heightened during the pandemic, that we're able to address them at a community level, you know, to look at ways to build resilience, to develop those protective factors so that long-term we're preventing suicidality and suicide death. This is really our time to prevent suicide deaths now. And I appreciate the partnership with AFSP and with the Aspen Institute and really look forward to engaging with all of our, you know, viewers and stakeholders out there on this. 
Well, thanks to both of you for your expertise and thanks to the Aspen Institute for hosting this conversation. We are gonna leave you with a slide of resources um, that will help, I hope, um, should you need to access uh, care for or help for someone that you love or yourself. Thanks so much, Rebecca. Thanks, Deb. And thanks to Ruth.